Everybody, yes. Paul, are you there? Mm-hmm. Hail, hail, everybody. Dr. J, smell the glove. Here we go. We are ready for a quick, quick show here. Just to go ahead and uh, let it all out after last week's uh, tirade that we went through, or the the, the bitching and screaming, uh, kicking and screaming type thing that I did last week. Which, like I said last week, I, I am nothing more than a tootsie pop. Hard on the outside, soft and chewy on the inside. Of course, rooted on the boys today. And we want to talk about today's song and the title of today, which is Ronnie Told You So, where he said that, you know, he, they were ready and they, all this other stuff. And when I, when I looking for, for intro music and, and Fort Minor, this song of, of, of High Road really speaks to me because this is for all the negativity that Celtic get in the press. I am so glad to see Ronnie just take the high road every freaking time. And it just show, it just oozes class from him that it's nothing more than, yep, I got you. Mm-hmm, yep. And we're ready. Yep. Yep. And we're ready. Mm-hmm, yep. Yep. And oh, seven, oh, seven million. We ain't selling for seven million. I mean, everything he says, everything he does and all those different things. I mean, just phenomenal watching, watch what happened today. And I am pleased with the nil draw and uh Paul D. What do you think? You pleased with the nil-nil draw, son? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I said at the start of the game, I'd bite your hand off for anything that would get us through. 
nil nil. I missed most of the first half due to getting called in a last minute meeting at work. Then I jumped in a taxi, actually a streetcar, down to McVeigh's in the downtown Celtic supporter CSC here in Toronto. Watched the second half. Um, enjoyed it. I thought we defended pretty well. Thought the Beata had a good game. Felt Lustig played well after a lot of criticism for the Izagiri. Izagiri played well. We really just defended really probably the best defensive performance I've seen for us in quite a while. I mean, people were saying that there's there's jokes about the the other team being all over us, but apparently they only got like two shots on target in the entire game. Yeah, and one of them. Big, yeah, yeah one of them was uh, it was absolutely just just Jesus saves on yeah. Gordon in the first half. Yeah, I saw Gordon save. That was absolutely Woo. fantastic, but. I think that, like as a unit, the defence played really, really well. I think Boyata, my kind of question mark about him was his pace, and maybe he wouldn't be the most intelligent, but be a big physical unit. But you know what, man? He used he used his strength to his advantage today, and just bullying players about the park. So I, I was loving that. I thought Lustig was strong and really intelligent on the ball. I think he, he, everything we done was really crisp in defence. Felt that just our movement was good. We didn't get caught out of position that often felt that we kind of like shepherded the ball out to the channels pretty well just like it's probably I just it's going to be a really difficult to think of a better defensive performance uh, from us for, for a long time because I mean you could you, chart, you could hark back to like you know Barcelona uh, when we beat them and then Barcelona the time we beat them before when Ronaldinho was playing but I think there was a lot of like fingertip saves from the goalkeepers in those situations and whatever we weren't we weren't playing Barcelona, obviously, but I just thought we played brilliantly in defence anyway. So, what did you think? so you want a quick jog on Yaldi for me? Okay, go for it. Jog on Yaldi, is he was helped by uh, sitting on the bench? I think he probably was. I think like any time a, a player gets gets told he's got to fight his way back into the team. You should, you, they'll respond in two ways they'll go in the half and get worse or they'll come out all guns blazing mm-hmm. and uh, I feel we had a really good game I think we've seen previously your boy Stokes in the past get benched and he's came back really strong so hopefully he's mature enough he doesn't seem like a white though he seems like a, a pretty level headed guy so chances are I do, Ronnie isn't one of those guys he's, he said before you know I couldn't, I couldn't understand the concept of shouting at players or you know, running them down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think the ch- ch- he's ch- chances are he sat as he down said, "Listen, mate, this is why you're not playing. This is why I've dropped you. This is what you need to do to get back to the team." Totally, I I, I take that totally as a Yaldi. I I think um, I'm un- I'm I'm under the impression and under the the um, the feelings that the most important thing that you can do with with any player. Is uh, have the have the understanding of for, iron forges iron, and to absolutely push push and push uh, to get people to see exactly what it is they're trying to get you know to push people to see what it is that you want them to accomplish doesn't happen by asking them, and sometimes in some situations it does, but most times, especially in in this type of situation, I think it is more helped because they took that away from him and said, yeah, oh yeah, you, the club means so much to you. Well, let me see you prove it. And I was really, really worried about him. The first, uh, the first two minutes, he got beat on the uh, near sideline to the to the TV, and it was interesting. He was clawing and, fought, and fighting and fighting and fighting to get, to get back in, in front of the ball to get goal side. And as he tried and tried and tried and tried, you know, he gave up the foul and he kept going. And that was the last time that he got beat uh, today. The first few minutes it was probably the first probably uh, three four minutes, and that was it. He didn't get beat again. But I will say this. Did you notice in the second half, we finally came into the game about the 60th minute? And at that point in time, did you notice that the fullbacks finally started to actually go upfield? That team was very, very narrow because they did not, they did not, they did not bomb the fullbacks. Lustig and Izzy. Izzy played well defensively because he was back there. A couple times he went forward, most of the time he did not. He, was, he wasn't bombing down, up and down. And I think... That's where, when we look at this, as far as we look at this, as far as you know, I told you so. Uh, I think that's the deal with Ronnie. That's what I love to see with him, is that you know, it's it's it, he's learning too, 
and we get to this point where you know it's not the same thing like it was you know in the past where we have we have a goal and then we start giving stuff up and and even you start looking at you know just exactly how they played they were so much more um we'll say prepared is a good word but I, i'd like to say more reserved offensively today you think yeah definitely i think i think the situation was we've done the old rope dope we let them come at us for a bit we kept their full bats back we're quite conservative and reserved in the first half well the early part of the second half i didn't catch most of the first half but then uh, yeah we definitely started to push forward a little bit further i think that our We've talked about our fitness in the show before, and I definitely think that we were more fit with them uh, in the latter half of the game. That really helped. Oh God! Us. Oh, oh God! Let, oh God! Yes! Oh God! Yes! I totally. I think that the wing bats started to stretch them a lot more. So uh, yeah, it kind of worked in our favour. It looked a really controlled performance from us. But I think like what we'll do is then um, we'll single out a couple of players that have taken abuse and a couple of players that have taken plaudits. So we'll start with the negative first, and then move on to the positive. But I think it was all very positive today. So the player that I'd highly is being, uh, we say man of the match, I think we agreed on this earlier on, but we'll come back to him, near near Baton, or near Baton. Then we've talked about GMS, uh, Armstrong and Forrest have all taken pelters in the last little while. And it's starting to get a wee bit annoying. <laughs> Jogging or Yaldi on this, right? So people giving shit to GMS and Armstrong saying, and I quote, not good enough, not Celtic class, we need to improve. Come on. So, right, like, <clears throat> firstly, right, we went and bought Gary McKay Stevens and Armstrong for like a couple of million quid. Exactly. From Dundee United at the ages of like 23 and 24. Did we really think that they were the finished article? No. Or, no, we bought No, them. even the, when the, the, who was the team that was going to buy Armstrong and they said that he was nothing more than a, uh, than a reserve player? Burnley. Right? Yeah, so we, Burnley. Yeah, we, exactly. We went to a, a smaller team than us in Scotland, bought two young players who were obviously hoping to bring in and make better football players. So after, you've given them six months and you decided they're not good enough? Or, or you know, I agree <laughs> with you. Or this, Dragon Yaldi, the uh, the whole conversation of, well, you know, what are we thinking? We're not going to be Champions League quality by, you know, by being by taking top Dundee's three three players from Dundee United. Well, like, but buying players and making them better, opposed to, like, are we really going to be able to go out and buy absolutely You're quality not. all the time? Like Derek Bo Richter from my ex and all that <laughs> <laughs> so like those those two have been taking pelters and I felt they played well today yeah, I think I don't think GMS had his best game no felt, but that's you know what but remember he you know he he, he yeah he did a lot of running he played really well on on, on uh, he played he got back he, he, people who think he couldn't get he couldn't be ours to be there today which which I mean blows me away when it comes down to that really don't even realize that the reason why he gets to go forward or has open space is because Every time on his right shoulder, Lustig or somebody is running down that right side. That yeah. didn't happen today. That's why I said at the very beginning, you know, we were very, very narrow. And the other, yep, the other, the other team were able to double up. On That's exactly right. Up. So mm-hmm. yeah, and, and not the, until the, the end. The not until the end became the biggest punching bag at Celtic Park's James Forrest. Now, first off, I'm going to qualify this and say that I'm not defending James Forrest. I'm not a James Forrest fanboy. I do like the player. Uh, I don't think he's playing particularly well. But I don't think we should like throw toys at the pram and just like say shite all the time. Well, tell you, you what, what can, I, can I can I back up? Can I can I back you up on that for two reasons? Okay. One is he. You just said the key words. You know, throw the toys out of the pram. He's not doing that anymore. He's yeah, remember he's, when he did that when he did that with with I know when he did it with with um, with Lenny. Remember he'd sit there and throw himself on the ground. He's yeah, not doing that now. Basically, throw himself on the ground and look for a free kick. Yeah. Just gets up. Now I think there's players that are in form and out of form. I don't think he's in form at the moment. I think when he's in form, he's a very effective player. But people are saying, oh, you know, he just like boots the ball past and chases the ball. Like, okay, yeah. Quite, quite, uh, quite, yeah. A lot, quite, quite a lot of wingers do that. For yeah, stars. exactly. Really, and be the, think, to be that fast, well, shit, go. What it is, is that, like, I think there's... Celtic are actually doing pretty well at the minute. There's, quite, there's not a lot to really moan about. So when there's not a lot to really moan about, people just focus all their... Because a lot of people just go to the football, these fucking angry as fuck people. They just go shout and scream and shout abuse. I mean, the team's playing well, and we're winning, and we've got a good manager, and everything's going well. They'll just they'll pick hairs at like the fucking slightest thing. Where so a guy who's not getting a game for us at the minute, not starting because he's not playing well enough, comes off the bench and you give him abuse. It's not like he start. I can understand he'd be starting every week. You know, Lenny when he was just suddenly undroppable. 
So yeah. and being frustrated about being picked. Yeah. He's not getting a fucking game. He's or fucking or you know what else the other the other complaint about him is? What? Well, you know, you know, to be honest with you, you got uh, you know, he he's always he's always injured. Since when? He hasn't been injured in almost nine months. Well, I don't, I don't know. He may, I, I haven't. No, he hasn't been. I mean, he hasn't. He literally has been available for 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 selection since he came back from his initial issue that was left over that Ronnie always talked about was a problem way back when he first took over, and he's had that issue with his hamstrings and everything else. And he said, "We're not playing him until." And then they didn't play, and then November came around. He's been fit since November. See, right, we brought him on after, what was it, the Celtic TV didn't have a clock on it today, so I couldn't clock yeah, exactly yeah, when he came on. But he came on, uh, what, the last 15 minutes, the last 10 minutes, something like that? What happened was, the other team needed a goal, so their defensive line pushed up the field, and then Ronnie pretty much rubbed his hands together and went, okay, Forrest, you go out and play wide right and sit on the last man, and then they're just going to play through balls to you and you run onto it, or you're going to beat a guy for pace and then and sprint onto it and stretch them. Which he'd done. He'd done that very effectively, and this is where he could be effective in Europe. I don't think he'd start him in Europe, but I think if you bring him off the bench, he could be very useful. Now, the point is, right, he ran through on goal on one of them, right, where he beat, he beat like, two men, right, putting the ball through their legs and chasing it and all that. Done really well. Ran through on goal, and they made the choice to cut it back. And everyone in the pub's like, oh, you're fucking pish, Forrest, what are you doing? You should have never cut it back. You should have never cut it back. Okay. Right. First of all, didn't they say, well played for getting through and goal? Frustration because we're not scoring the goal. Your frustration because we hadn't scored the goal. That's what it was. See if he'd ran through and goal at that narrow angle and had a shot on goal and the keeper had saved it. Everyone in that, build, everyone in that room would have been shouting, oh, fuck's sake, Forrest, you should have cut it back. No, no, you can't win. <laughs> the yeah. guy can't fucking and, win. And if he cuts it back and, and, and Griffith scores there, oh my God, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. I know. I don't know. But anyway, I, I know. so I felt that... Um, it's a reasonable outing for Forrest. I think that's that's how he's going to be effective. Coming off the bench like a coiled spring, ready to run at people. Mm-hmm. I think Griffiths could be effective in that kind of respects as well. If we do start with Shifty. Um, so I thought Armstrong, GMS, in the second half, like I said, I didn't see most of the first half. Uh, didn't play too badly. I don't think they had their best games, but they were solid enough. But yeah, but you know, remember, remember, they, those guys get a lot of joy down the flanks because you have people that are willing to, take, yeah. to run up and down. He yeah. just didn't release people until later in the after sixty minutes, and that's one of the things that we that we were happy about. When remember when when you and I first started doing this, the conversation about Ronnie talking about fitness, everything else, and all, every, you know us going, well, I don't see why the, everyone's upset about that. Well, you got to understand, there's two things. This we won this tie because of fitness. And if you look at when we played the last game, right, it's two, two or three o'clock in the morning their time. They played 90 minutes. They, they go into defensive laps. Boyata scores the header. Today, we kick off at noon our time, like as body clock goes with, for them, right? Or what is it, five o'clock. At five o'clock their own time, which is perfect. Uh, so now it just becomes a test of, a test of pure endurance. At the end of the game, our defense played absolutely stellar at the end of the game. They they cut people off. How many times did Brown go to ground to go ahead and, and, and tackle people? It was, you know, it was just one of those situations, I thought, today, yeah. where it was 100% fitness, and that's the reason why they didn't score. That and the fact that, I can't, I can't we, can't, the fact that we can't pay Gordon enough money. But anyway. I'll, I'll add something else to it, that you're saying fitness. I think we're running back – making challenges, especially some of the ones where sometimes the ball bounces wrong, just on the turf, and you've got to make a last gasp challenge. We made those effectively and composed. I think the composure also showed when we won the ball, and we didn't just launch it down the field. We put it on the deck and tried to yep. play football with it. Mm-hmm. We, yeah. we re- we're really effective yep. in distributing it out yep. of the wings into the short midfield man. Yep, And the only so, time that, that backfired on us was, and I, and, I, and I was waiting for it, I just went to Twitter to wait to see when it was going to happen. And as soon as soon as like Izzy tried to actually just like blast the ball out, it just deflected off somebody, and they and and Carbach actually ended up having to hold on to the ball for a few more minutes, but or a few you know one more attack. And it's like, oh Izzy, you're just on you know we can't we can't trust you in Europe. No 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 no. The guy played phenomenal all entire game. In fact, you know we get to the man and match conversation. I'm willing to say you know uh, I'm willing to go ahead and have a conversation about who I think should be there. But he played that well. And I think he played that well because Ronnie put a spur, put spurs on, and spurred him. And then he got sick and tired of putting, you know, uh, 
uh, splinters in his ass from sitting on the bench. And I th- and I'm willing to bet you nine ninety nine dollars to a dollar. That's exactly what that is. Yeah, I think like one thing about today, just away from individual players, just overall as a, as a team, all yeah. the ex- all the usual excuses were there for Celtic. Yep, like all the were- we had to fly to the, the other side of Europe, which is technically Asia. Okay, check. Oh, it's thirty degrees. Kick off. Check. We're having to change stadiums because everything's a farce. Check. Oh, the pitch is terrible. Check. Like all the usual excuses where we fuck up were there. And we didn't greet about it. We just went out and played a really intelligent, composed game of football. It's preparation and having a really intelligent manager and intelligent coaching staff. It's guys like John Collins as well. They keep us. We were just we they, the press were trying to ham it up. They're saying, "Oh, the pitch is shite." They're giving them out. They're giving them really easy things to make excuses. And mm-hmm. God bless Neil Lon- Lennon. Neil Lennon would have jumped at those and been like, "Ah, the pitch is terrible. We'll see what we can do." Which is fair enough. Managers are fair enough to say that. Mm-hmm. What did What did Ronnie and Collins say? Especially Collins, who goes, "Doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah. matter what surface we play on. Yeah. We played in worse surfaces in yeah. Scotland. If you got to play on the moon, let's go play on the moon." Exactly. So yeah. just, th- I, I want to hear that well, for, for a team going to play in, away in Europe. So maybe John Collins has been to European Cup semi final in Monaco. Ronnie Dyla's uh, obviously not had that level of uh, European experience, but I'm glad we've got a guy like John Collins there just telling guys, nah, get your act together, no excuses, just go out and do it. So, fair enough. But anyway, before we go into... Um, Wait, hold on, before, 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 before you get into that, hell, hell, Rev, Rev's with us. How you doing? All right, hey. so let's just want to let Rev in real quick for, uh, for uh, he gets to that. So, uh, Rev, uh, what, what, did you get a chance to watch a lot of this today? I watched the first half and I had to go take care of stuff and, you know, just tried to follow the best I could in the second half. So what's good? Yeah. I watched the second half. There you go. So, so the between half. the three of us, we got the whole game covered. What's the, uh, so, so Rev, uh, real quick, let me ask you just before we get into this, you saw the first half. Did you think that uh, Armstrong and, and Steven deserved uh, that much grief for their performance? No, like you were saying, you know, it, the, the game just wasn't played you know, to really suit them, unfortunately. Um, it seemed like, you know, we were trying to do, uh, you know, at least in the first, uh, some long balls and try to maybe make up for the fact that the pitch was shit because um, short passes were just ping-ponging. And, you can, you know, even on a, you know, really poor definition uh, stream that I had, you can tell the ball is just bouncing all over the place and it's just getting, you know, beat up. And, uh, you know, so the... The, the, you know, short pass, beautiful, quick, you know, play that we're used to was totally ineffective today, I think. Um, but, yeah, like like you're saying, our fitness is basically what got us through to, to the next round. And, you know, but even more so, um, you know, if, if we would have played, say, uh, you know, Spanish team, for example, or something like that, or someone like in our time zone, that or close to it, that also... You know, like you like you said, that that played a big part too. So those two things combined were really um, against uh, Karabakh. Yeah, I, I, yes, totally, and that's what happened last time. Because if we, you know, yeah, if we would have had say the same <clears throat> same condition pitch, same uh, quality of, of opposition to play, um, but if uh, you know they were a little more in tune time wise, I think it would have been. A little harder and yeah at least you know those first uh the first half saves by gordon i mean he, from what from just from what i saw i'd put him up there as man of the match i mean i don't know how much he had to do in the second half but definitely from the first half he uh he went from you know previously not doing much of anything in past games to now like really stepping up and being you know where he had to be and making some pretty fantastic saves yep yep i'm with you a hundred percent so, uh, Paul, you were going to say something. What was it? What were you going to say? Yeah, well, there's just a follow-on for the Rev about Man of the Match, where um, I think a lot of people picked out near Breton. I think that in the second half, I don't think I can really comp- argue him. I felt that he's just so neat on the ball, where he, he's able to bring the ball in where he's under a lot of pressure to go about very coolly and uh, distribute the ball about with short passing. Um, so I, I, I would have picked him out as Man of the Match. To be honest with you, but you, want, question, you want the best tweet of the day about Near Baton? Which one? I don't know who it was. It said Near Baton could chest trap, chest and trap a, a scud missile. <laughs> 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 that 
that was pretty good. Whoever said that, that was you know that was awesome. But anyway, yes, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. I, th- I think he was making himself available. We were making these little triangles, etc. Very silky football, and he's beating guys. He's putting through people's legs. I mean, you don't always have to do that. But I'd give him man of the match, right? However, I've got a kind of question about him. Where are we potentially overhyping him due to his silky moves? Now, a defensive midfield player, which effectively is kind of playing that sitting defensive, well, maybe not so much defensive, but a sitting midfielder role, right? We're not used to guys who do step overs and put it through people's legs and able to beat a man and do the spin around the ball. Are we potentially overhyping him due to his flashy moves? Are we overvaluing him? Well, see, I think he's like, I think he's been fantastic for us, but I think we've seen too many players turn, what well, we've used the term before, turn into a pumpkin. We've got a guy in. He's looked amazing, then suddenly turns a wee bit pish. And I'm worried that, obviously, we might get someone as well that ends up like that. Because we really are thinking that he's a world beater at the minute. Um, I want to see the guy play over a full season, just from start to finish, and just be really consistent before I start sh- popping the champagne corks. But uh, do we ever overvalue the guy, or is he really as good as we think? Because right now, he looks fucking amazing. Yeah, no, I'm with, yeah, total 100%. He, he he played that well today, and he was and he was smooth. And I, there's a I was a, at my son's uh, training today. They, they're starting their season up, and uh, one of the parents there is a huge um, um, Maccabi Haifa fan, and he he follows. So the first thing, he follows Baton specifically because I mean he 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 loves watching him, and the first thing he said to me was, uh, "How did it go today?" I'm like, "Hey, how's it going?" He's like, "No, no, how'd it go?" So how'd what go? He goes, "How did Baton play?" He's so you know he's so worried about how Baton played. I said, listen, he is so smooth, and he said that the biggest co- the biggest thing that people talk about when they talk about Baton as far as in, on the as the uh, Israeli national team, we, what they talk about is that people complain even there is the whole issue with him is he, he looks like he's moving in slow motion and he doesn't care. Hmm. I can but, see that. Yeah, but he's so, but he but he's so smooth. He just you know he he glides and then he gets in there. You know, and that was one of the big things that when he first started playing. It's like, oh, he's shy for the tackle and everything else. I tell you what, he, um, he, 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 and Brown today in the middle of that in the middle of that pitch, you know, sitting in front of the front in front of the back four, looked really, really, really good. He 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 did his job today. He really right, did. I think I think I've probably structured the question wrongly there. Where okay, I think we all agree that his, his performances at the moment and over the last you know four or five months have been, have been pretty good. I think the next step for a player is you get you get players like Kyle's done a six months period where he looked like a world beater. You know, I mean, he looked really really good. See this player that we've got. Just how good is he? Is he is he is he good enough? Right to the, the level of form that he has right now to carry that through an entire season. The answer is since there's no Lee McCullough, I think he has a good chance. I think. And like, I think <laughs> that's what the problem with Kyle uh, didn't he get uh, an injury? That really, that's what fucked him up. Yeah, it was, it was a Lee yeah, like a, challenge. an ankle injury. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, the, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, I've got really high hopes for this guy, and I've just been bitten so many times by players turning a wee bit of shit. Um, I mean, he, there's, there's, if you look at Forrest, Forrest had periods where he looked like a, a really class football player and just kind of tailed away, especially the young players. Um, I think with all players, if Celtic get a player, right, if Celtic land a young football player that's not been picked up by Barcelona or Real Madrid. Manchester City, all those big clubs like obviously Nier Baton was on trial with Man City he's not quite the finished article there's something wrong with him and there's two ways for it to go it's one, we hide that we hide the uh, the the bit of his game that is stopping him from being a world beater and then suddenly, after a while it, it gets exposed and we're like, shit, what the fuck has happened here and he just falls to pieces because of that. Well, I think there, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about that right now. I'm not worried about that right now with him because if he continues to do this now at this level of competition, he's not. I mean, if he's not going to get found out at this level of competition, it's not going to happen well, in Scotland. It's, it's a qualifier, right? So yeah. Say, but right, however, there's two things where we haven't found the. Inc- is, is it one of two things here where we haven't found an inconsistency in him that will later be exposed, or? Has there been inconsistencies in his game where he was benched last year, where Ronnie's coached it out of him? Because this player was not good enough to play for Celtic this time last year. Well, I mean, isn't that, we, the, isn't that the isn't that Ronnie's point when he took over? Yeah, th- this 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 player was 
in, in our manager's eyes, not as good as Charlie Mulgrew this time last year. And now this guy looks like a world beater. Well, wait a second. Before you go any further, let's, let's, let's think about this too. In this, and, and we have to look at this as what, what he's looking for, what he wants. And as we're talking about Ronnie now. Um, you're beginning to see the clear out of all of Neil Lennon's players. Because I'll tell you this, there's no way in the world that I, I I don't I don't buy it for a second that Rojic is is a is a better person on that bench than Tony Stokes. Sorry, I just don't. Now that <laughs> sorry, I just don't. I just don't. I don't. I don't. I don't buy it. I, I, I agree with you there. Okay. He's got. He's young. He's got probably raw talent potential, but the state of player he is right now, no, not the so No, and he hasn't. And he hasn't played forever. So yeah. the, so the issue is. You've got a player now, okay? You have, you have these players now that, that aren't his, quote-unquote his, right? Unless he sees them able to fit into a system, he's going to dump them. So, you know, with Baton, you know, the, the, the system he was playing in doesn't fit for him. The same way, you know, that's probably the reason why Stokes probably isn't on that bench. It's because that does, just doesn't fit him. He's got Forrest and Commons to go on the wide because they're not going to go in the middle of the field. He's not going to replace their hands. And so there's, that's exactly the reason why. And if something happens to, you know, uh, to someone with a more tooth in the middle, I'm going to put Rojic in there as compared to Stokes. I get that. Totally get that. But what I'm saying here is you've got Baton, okay? And Baton is, is playing as, 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 as well as he can. And I really believe the reason for that is because in training, in the setup that's going on there, I have to honestly believe that Ronnie just looks at, at Mulgrew and says, dude, you really can't be playing there. And the only reason why he was playing there last year was because he was playing with Neil's, pe- Neil's people. So, yeah. you know, and I oh. want, and I gotta, I gotta say that Baton has been, tra- you know, it has been coached and has been trained and all that different stuff to be able to play in the role he's playing in. And there is no way Mulgrew's covering the same, the same, the same amount of turf that Baton uh, is. I think, I think there's two different things here. There's one you're seeing, uh, Baton's been groomed to fit in a system. I'm saying that forget, regardless of what formation you play, whether it be three five two, four three three, four four two, four one three two, whatever you want to play, right? That Baton, as an overall football player, potentially had inconsistencies, and Ronnie's coached it out of him. Or is it a case where we're later down the line we're going to find out that he's not as good as we think he is? I'm hoping, I'm hoping that when Ronnie came in and Ronnie benched him for a period of time. That's that's where Ronnie took him aside and basically wh- whatever glaring things that he felt was wrong with his game, he coached out of him. And now the player that we see now on the field is what we see is what we get for the next four years as a Celtic player. Because if we, if we get this, see the near baton that we have right now that played those 90 minutes of football today. If we have that player for four years... No, we won't. We, we have, yeah, yeah I, I will probably fucking sell him. But if we have him, for the remaining time that he's a Celtic player at this level, we've got a hell of a football player who will be very effective for us and probably a little cash in on him. If he does cash in on him, you'll be getting a hell of a lot of money back. Or you've got a guy who plays well for six months to a year and then falls to fucking pieces like Kyle, like all the rest of them that came through that look good and then the, the bubble burst. So I'm hoping that because of Ronnie as a manager, that we've basically got what we see is what we get. Well, well, this guy. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. I don't think anyone's going to so, argue uh, with that. Anyway, can I just say, what, what we'll do is quickly move on to best and worst of the internet. Good. And that's going to that's gonna tie us into the next segment, right? So Good. Cool. So the best thing I saw on the internet over the last couple of days were, uh, Bruni, the, do you see Bruni at the end of the game screaming in the guy's face? Yes, that was awesome. Yeah, that was Love it. And the other one was uh, the picture of Baton and uh, Lustig holding carrier bags. So I'm going to show Photoshop Tesco carrier bags. <laughs> <laughs> Well, remind, I saw the picture. What was the comment? I think it just said Celtic versus carrier bag or something. Oh, like carry bag. Got it. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Rev, do you see anything you've done on it? Um, something to kind of make fun of. Uh, there was, uh, I guess, the you know TFO banner that uh, carrier bag supporters made. And it, <laughs> did you see it? And it sell dicks or something like that. Yeah. So it just sell with a yeah big dick. It's like all right. I, whatever. Congrats. Hey, don't forget, don't forget. I mean, English is their second language, so I'm okay with that. Yeah, um, <laughs> okay, the, the the worst thing on the internet that I've seen, or it's not really anything, but it, it's going to bring it's going to bring in the next segment is right. 
what I done on Twitter was I was at work and I didn't really have time to, to find out when the next qualifiers were. But obviously, I wanted to find that out due to try to take time off work or uh, schedule my work around the next uh, group of qualifiers because it's, it's going to be a huge game for us. Both games are like cup finals. You know, it's it's the biggest game in the Celtic season. Try to get in the Champions League. You know what I mean? Uh, so <laughs> I put out on Twitter, when's the next dates? And I got these guys being like, just Google it. And I did Google it, and I couldn't find the answer. So like people saying, just Google it, and like, what? <laughs> yeah, I understand that Google has the answer to fucking everything. It's not the case of, oh, I don't think Google will have the answer to this. It's just not being able to find it, because it's fucking 60 pages of information before you finally get the official date of when Celtic are playing. So, so with that in mind, I decided that this is going to be the most researched podcast we've ever done, because I spent... Two hours at the end of the work, going through Wikipedia, yeah, <laughs> that great bastion of knowledge, getting the information on every single team that we could play in the next qualifying round. So does that, <laughs> does that seem good? We're going to do a rundown. You're going to give me a rundown. Okay, so first question I have for you is how many teams are there? We can get five teams. And okay. I can't pronounce any of them. <laughs> so I want you to pronounce the one team, and I know I know you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, the uh, Cor- Corsi. It's uh, Skin Derbu. Corsi or some shit like that, fuck knows. I really apologise, but we're going to do another thing. Since you're Americans, and uh, I always tease Americans about not knowing where where, uh, oh, where Jesus clubs Christ. are from, <laughs> you can try and guess. Oh my God. Right, I'm going to run it down, and uh, this is reverse order of their coefficient. So, the worst team that we could possibly get is FC Astana. So, where are F- without checking, because I'll be able to hear your keyboard clucking, where is FC Astana from? Uh, just north of where we were, uh, where we were just were, not um. Was Est- where was uh, Shakhtar Karagandy from? It just, it's the next Very- country north. Then, w- then, the- then where Karabakh is. <laughs> the next country north. Rev, you got any ideas? Uh, Kazakhstan. It is Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, that's right. Oh, the land of Bora. <laughs> so keep in mind that when we did play uh, Karagandhi, they slaughtered a goat, was it? To, yes. To sell it to, for good luck. They did. But this is a little bit on FC Astana. Um, they were actually founded in 2009, so it's like quite a relatively new club. Um, the club the club colours are yellow and pale blue. Uh, vertical stripes for home and pale blue and yellow. And guess who they beat to get here? Astana beat Salzburg. No. Who'd they beat? The, uh, the Polish team, I think, right? They beat Maribor. Maribor. Yeah. They beat Maribor 3-2, and then they beat HJK Helsinki 4-3. So they've never actually qualified for This is the furthest they've ever been in Europe. But that doesn't actually say much, because they've only really been a team since 2009. So they're ranking... Hey, hey, t- hey, hey, hey. D- don't, don't, don't diss that. They're older than uh, than Sevco. They are older than Sevco. Um, are they? When did Sevco come in? Uh, 2012. Is it 2012? Yeah. Oh, how time flies. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't, can't believe in those three short seasons they're playing the Champions Hey, League. hey, hey, listen. <laughs> listen. <laughs> hey, Paul, Paul, let me, let me play something for you. Listen to this. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our ed- education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and I believe that yeah, I they anything. should... You don't hear anything? Our education no, we don't hear anything. here in the All right, just tell us what you're saying. I think the viewers are okay, here. Okay, the people listening who get it. This is the Miss Teen South Carolina in 2007, who said uh, the people and uh, maps and um, and Americans don't know maps don't have because they don't have maps they can't tell where anything is on a map because they don't own maps and like our education like in South Africa and in should help South Africa and uh, probably rambles as much as I do. But I love yeah, that. Anyway, so so this, so that so I just wanted to back up your your comment that Americans don't know anything about geography. Great. Well, uh, I'll give you a wee bit of. Uh, We'll go back to geography in a minute, but just to let you know, they're ranked 283rd, so this is the, apparently the worst, well, the thing, coefficient and ranking doesn't go hand in hand, which is quite strange, but, uh, <laughs> from the look of it, but yeah, they're ranked 283rd in Europe, 
Um, so they've got a Bulgarian manager that I've never heard of before who's led them to the League and Super Cup. So obviously, Ooh, the Kazakh, Kazakhstan Super Cup's a, a big thing. So they live, they actually, they, it is actually a city called Astana. Astana is the, the capital of Kazakhstan. It's located on the Ishim River, sorry about the pronunciation, north portion of Kazakhstan. Um, and what else about it? The population census in 2014 said there's about 835,000 people within the city, making it second largest city in Kazakhstan. But here's the, the important shit. The important shit is this. It's 27 hours flight from Toronto, and the flight costs $1,084. So... <laughs> Can, Canadian dollars? Canadian dollars. Oh, so that's like a, that's like eighty seven dollars American. Let's do that. Yes, no, it's, it's, it's about fifty quid now, man. <laughs> I, I've been saving up money to pay off my credit card, uh, my British credit card in uh, British pounds, and I've nearly started fucking greeting because just all my money's went away. But the important, the, here's a really important bit. What do you think the price of a pint is in Ooh. Astana in British pounds? Red, this is harder for you because I know you don't spend as much time in the UK. But Doctor Jesa, I'd say. Possibly. A, a pint, a pint in the UK is usually around four and a half, five, five quid. So, uh, let's say uh, two, two fifty, two pound fifty. Fifty, Rev, you got any? One fifty. One fifty. It's actually two pound seventy one. Mm. Two, two pound seventy one, according to this website that I found. Um, so yeah, they're probably the weakest team that we're going to get. However, obviously going really far away kind of fucks with us. But we've already been to Azerbaijan, so Azerbaijan's probably the same trip. Isn't Kazakhstan the next country north of Azerbaijan? It's, well, it's, it's, I'm not sure. I can't remember if it's north or whatever. Oh, and then you busted it, my balls about my geography. Go ahead. No, it's, all right. It's part, it's part of the old USSR. So yes. All the Bajans and Kazakhstans are basically off the south of, of Russia. But anyway, right, so they're the weakest team. However, I know Paul of will be going there. Yes. As far, as far as I'm aware. God bless him. As far as I'm aware, you need a visa to go to Kazakhstan. So it's going to actually be really hard if you don't want to go over to that game. However, don't quote me on that. I think you need a visa if you're from the UK. Well, I'll say this. Th- there was the same story that happened um, and by, uh, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan. Ka- uh, oh, no. I take that back. Oh, God, no. It is. No, it's not the next country up. I'm sorry. It's like Azerbaijan and Bekka. That's like. They, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's across much- the Caspian Sea. How about that? Right, you gotta get you gotta get that map switched off. Because I, I'm still giving you quiz questions here. Oh, sorry. Okay. By the way, God bless Paul, uh, Paul Tim. But anyway, um, the, the other thing was, did you see that you needed a you needed a, a, a visa to get into Azerbaijan also? And uh, Celtic, to their credit, and I will say this, set it up so that if you got uh, uh, the uh, Celtic uh, FSO uh, your info, he, they got you. A visa. A visa that's really, from the airport. That's uh, really, really useful. Um, yeah. That's really, really cool as I'm doing because as someone that's basically flown all over the world from my work, going through a lot of African countries, going through a lot of Asian countries, it is an absolute nightmare to get visas. So uh, well done to them. Right, so the next cu- the next team up is the one that we can't pronounce. We're going to just call them KF for short because it's... <sighs> fuck, shall I make an arse of myself and try and pronounce this? Skanderbu. Skanderbu. Corsi, which isn't Corsi because there, it's spelled K O R C E, but the C's got an accent and E's got an accent on it. So fuck knows how to pronounce that. We'll call them K F. So where do you think this mob are from? What country do you think they're from, Riv? I'm gonna guess Turkey because that's the only place I can really think of with the C that looks like that. That's not right, but it's actually a relatively good guess. Uh, what about you, Doctor J? Uh, say the name one more time. <laughs> You're taking the <laughs> I, I I don't know. Let's uh, Serbia. Serbia. It's not Serbia. They're actually Albanian. Oh, so the second on. that we draw them, Rudy Vata is going to be called Celtic player Albanian. Um, so they play in Albanian Superliga, which is a top tier in their country. They're also, the reigning champions have won their league five times in a row, and they're six overall. No, their fifth consecutive title and sixth overall title in 2015. Don't know how that works. Anyway, um, we're named after uh, Albania's national hero, and uh, they play their home games at the Stadium Skederim. Was it Skenderbu? Fuck knows. It's like just o- just over 12,000 capacity. But here's what's quite interesting about them for me. Anyway, right? the supporters group. It's called something that I'm not even going to try and pronounce, but it translates literally into snow wolves, okay? 
So their the district's uh, 140,000 people, and their sport is the Snow Wolves. But the Snow Wolves factions of their ultras have got factions in different cities around the world, including Toronto, Canada. Oh, then you'll so, be welcome there with open arms. <laughs> So if we draw them, I can fucking noise up these snow wolves in Toronto. So I'm going to track these guys down and fucking have a rammy with them. But, uh, the home colours are basically the Kilmarnock shirt. It's blue and white stripes of Porto or whatever you want to say. The away colours is all black and they have a third shirt, which is just all white. They're ranked 378th in Europe. So technically that's further out than Ash, uh, Astana, even though Astana has... A even though Astana position. is further out. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus um, Christ, the stand and minus will I mean they might as well be play, playing that game in Hawaii. Yeah. Fucking Jesus hell, Christ. I just looked at the map. Holy fuck, a stand See this mob, right? This mob might actually be quite probably uh, technically even though the coefficient is better than Astana. I think this is an easier game for a couple of reasons. One, their European rankings higher according to the July rankings, three hundred and seventy eighth. Also, they've just got a new manager. They had a manager who's Nigerian who's just left in June. And now they've just got a, um, a new guy in. So hopefully that kind of fuck up won't be that great for them. Uh, so <laughs> the city itself, uh, Corsia, we'll just call it, fuck knows how you actually pronounce it, is in southeastern Albania. It was it was formed in 2000, it was formed in 2015 due to a merger of other smaller towns. Uh, has a population of about 75,000 or 76,000 and, uh, so so let's get to the tough stuff. You told me the last one about what's going on in Astana. How much is a point there? All right. <laughs> Actually, we'll do the flight first. The flight okay. from Toronto to there will cost me $1,204.28. How is that possible? Because Kazakhstan is another seven hours east. Well, I think it's actually just routes because they're both like you fly somewhere else in Europe and then fly there. So Okay. So you know, so basically, I'm going to fly to Amsterdam, places. and then to yeah, get to Kazakhstan, I actually have to take like a mule. There's, there's probably more people who go to Kazakhstan for oil and shit like that than there are people who go to Albania. Jesus Christ! So <laughs> even though it's closer, it's also in the mountains as well. It's I mean, it's Albania. Can I can I just go ahead and get to Italy and then take and then swim across? Probably. Aye. That's well, probably easier. Anyway, price of the paint. What do you think of price of the paint is? Rev, what do you think? It's in euros, by the way. I'll give you this in euros. Oh. Oh, in euros. That might as well be uh, Toronto dollars. Yeah, that's uh, what's what's a euro now? It's like it's a like dollar. a dollar eight or a dollar twelve or something like that. It's pretty close. Oh, it's pretty even now. Yeah, All it's right. almost it's uh, almost even. I'll say two twenty five. Two twenty five. Uh, Seventy British pence, whatever that is. So zero yeah. point seven pounds. Yeah. Yeah, the euro is a dollar nine right now. Anyway, uh, actually, well, I can, if I use this, I can convert it. So I can give you it in pounds. All right, I'll give you it in pounds. So, what do you think it's in pounds, Fred? Yeah, oh, in pounds. Uh, well, then it's even less. I'd say that's like one. One pound. All right. Pound a pint. Uh, I'd say uh, a pound thirty-five, without going over. Right. <laughs> this is this is where the the one thousand two hundred and four dollars becomes valuable. One pint in Corsa is 31 pence. Ho! <laughs> 31 pence a pint of lager. Let's get there, man. How minging would the Celtic support be oh if they're my drinking God. 31 pence lager? But you do, need, but you, do you need a uh, visa to get in? Albania? No. I think I don't think Albania is part of the EU, but I don't think it's very hard to get in. Mm. It's not like whatever. Well, shit, at 31 pence, that's where that, that's, that sounds like a place to go for a guy's weekend. Yeah, it's man. Yeah. So um, the next the next mob up are uh, Malmo. So you must know this one, right, yeah. Rev? Where are yeah. Malmo from? Sweden. Sweden. Uh, Sweden. So uh, obviously one of the bigger teams in Sweden, reigning Swedish champions, uh, formed in nineteen nineteen ten. They've done had some European success. Had a lot of famous guys being involved in it. They play in blue. Their away shirt is black. Uh, we've got a Norwegian manager at the minute. So. They're, they have several fan clubs. Uh, their official fan club is MFF Support, which was founded in 1982, making them kind of one of the older kind of ultra groups. They're a non-profit organisation, kind of similar to the Green Brigade, where they're um, against like violence and racism. However, they're not political. 
and um, yeah, they have like proper fucking elected chairmen and stuff like that. How, how civilized? It's fucking hell. It's so, Sweden, Sweden, Norway, <laughs> Finland. I mean, come on. Yeah, the um, there's a sorry the, the the ultras group is called Supras Malmo, which was founded in 2003 by a coalition of smaller ultras groups and devoted fans. Uh, yada 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 nothing really that interesting right basically the average attendance for the games is 14,000 uh, they, they don't like IAK which was uh, the team that Mialbi went to was it not? he was from IAK or did he go back there? can't remember I don't remember anyway right so, sorry, sorry their main rivals are IFK Gothenburg so yeah what else about them? yada 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 how much oh, did yeah. you fight? Well, actually, before that, just so you know, Mal- Malmo was, right, sp- see in Sweden, Swedish, there is a huge, huge racism thing in Sweden, where uh, I know actually a guy who plays Swedish first uh, Premier Division football for Syrianski, who are an immigrant team, and in Sweden they have things which are like immigrant cities, and um, where all of, obviously a lot of the immigrants live, but there's a lot of racial tension in them. Malmo is actually a reputation of being a multiculturalized city, and... Um, but it's basically where all the immigrants stay in their city and there's a lot of like kind of gangs that don't like immigrants, kind of like neo-Nazi element. So it's pretty it's meant to be pretty violent. And if you type in Malmo on Google today, the number one thing that comes up where today is uh, three men stabbed over the course of last night in that city due to racial conflict. So So yeah, we may that may not be a place we want to go. Definitely not a place we want to go. Also Get to the price of lager. What do you think the price of lager is in Malmo? Uh, I'll say I. Are they? I'll say three euro because they're they're in the EU, right? Well, two in pounds. Two in pounds. Oh, uh, two seventy five. Two seventy five, Doctor J. Four twenty five. <laughs> You're closer. Remember, the cost of living in Sweden is ridiculously high. It's five pounds oh, yeah. eight pence for a lager. Mind you. There's some places in London that charge that. So yeah, yeah. Nice. listen, I've been I've been in airports in the US that charge more than that. Yeah, yeah. So it's the flight for, the flight from Toronto is uh, one thousand and seventy five dollars. So I really hope we don't get them. Right, next up is Partizan. Wait, you skipped a, an important part. They what? played a, a huge game a couple of years ago. They um oh, the they knocked the hunt out. out. They did. From they did. Connection. Well done. Also, didn't um, Roy Hodgson used to manage them? Oh, isn't that the team uh, Ronnie played for? Malmo. Is that because didn't he play? Didn't he play for uh, what's his face? Didn't he play for Roy Hodgson? Don't know if it was there. Um, could be anyway. Right. Anyway, I'll move on though because this is going to drag on for a bit, so we'll try not to bore everyone. Uh, right. Part, partisan Belgrade. Where are they from? Really easy. Where's Belgrade? Serbia. Yeah, Serbia. Glad you built Doctor J out there because he wouldn't have fucking known. Right. <laughs> it's in Partizan. <laughs> All right, so um, they used to be one of the powerhouses of uh, European football back in the day, the old Yugoslavia, etc. Um, won European Champions Cup in 1955. Long standing rivalry with Red Star Belgrade, who are probably a little bit better known. Uh, the Red Star Belgrade and Partizan Belgrade rivalry was named. Uh, by the Daily Mail, I'm not seeing the Daily Mail are a great reference, as uh, the fourth most vicious rivalry in football of all time. So if you think of like Broca Plate, it'll probably be in there, the old firm will probably be in there. And so being up in, in that kind of that kind of uh, category shows just how much they care about the football. And obviously they have the thing as well of like a lot of uh, religious and um, ethnic uh, support of certain groups and racism so they are not these guys are not nice characters at all uh, they're, pro- they're the most they're the most uh, popular club in Serbia but like I was saying they're really really dirty side of them they're, they're known to have uh, like kind of Nazi element to them uh, you've seen swastikas and all that sort of thing at their games I think if I remember rightly yeah they, they team up they're, they're their ultras are called the Grave Diggers or the Undertakers, and as far as I remember, they team up with like is it Real Madrid. I think it might be. Well, actually, no. I know that um, they played Spurs in last year. Oh, that would have been interesting. 
Yeah, they had to play mm. obviously a Nazi element. Yeah. They had an, uh, obviously, the London there was a there's a London sitcom that's very famous called Only Fools and Horses, but they had the the partisan fans held up a sign that was said only Jews and pussies and had swastikas on it. Um, so that was so you basically got banned. So it's Europe. expensive. Uh, oh no no I'm oh, sorry you were talking about yeah Belgrade. Yeah. Okay got it. So it, it's by the way by the way just let you know it was Viking. That he played for Roy Hodgson. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, it's really fucked up. Belgrade itself is kind of mixed. There's about uh, 1.23 million people there, 1.65 million in the metro area, which is a bit outside there. It is meant to be. There's like a lot of cool stuff there. There's a very famous music festival called Exit Festival, which is down in Serbia that people like going to. But overall, it's not really a place you'd probably go on holiday. A lot of crime. A lot of violence, that sort of thing, and neo Nazis running about killing people. So, <laughs> if I wanted to go on vacation there, the flight would cost me one thousand and eighty dollars. And what do you think the price of a pint is in British pounds? Uh, one fifty. I'd say they'd be they'd be pretty cheap. So I'd say like one twenty five. It's actually a pound. pound, a pound. Yeah, I was gonna say. So, uh, one thing is just like so they're obviously going to be gunning for Celtic fans. They're really fucking maddies, uh, neo Nazis. There's like schools of football hooliganism that they go to to basically learn to be mental hooligans and stab people. So they're just going to be gunning for Celtic fans a second they're over there. So if we do go over there, take care of yourself. And um, next up is well the the highest ranked team that we could possibly play is Maccabi Tel Aviv so <laughs> I'm even going to ask you you know where they're from they're from, they're from Israel uh, founded in 1922 after they had another team that was in 1909 that kind of folded into another club uh, they've got a couple of connections that are, are famous connections recently Jordi Cruyff Johan Cruyff's son was director of football he's only recently left and of course the head coach in between 2012 and 2013 was Oscar Garcia. There you go. He was up for the Celtic job. Um, yeah, so, and, and, yeah, and then he left and all that. Yeah, he's got some mental issues. Yeah, not liking where he is. Yeah. Um, the uh, the the ultras are called the Maccabi Fanatics, who are located in Gate 11 of the stadium. Uh, and guess what? They are close friends with VAK. 410 of Ajax who attacked the Celtic fans in Amsterdam with pickaxes uh, and that's why Ajax fans took such exception to Celtic fans flying uh, Palestinian flags so if we go there and start flying Palestinian flags the whole thing is going to fucking kick off to be very honest with you yeah. I'm not saying don't do it I'm just saying it's going to be mental so uh, yeah there's them and Hapwell Tel Aviv are the big rivalry, so it's like uh, the big Tel Aviv rivalry it's actually referred to as. And then, guess what? There is a Scottish football connection which a couple of people have noticed have picked up on, and I was gutted that people have already figured this out because I wanted to break it. Who would be connected to this club that we've mentioned on the show before? Like, who is our CEO of uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv? Oh, Jesus. I don't know. Who? That's right. Former Rangers director Martin Bain. Really? Uh, Martin Bain is a hun. He's a hun that owns the club. Uh, Martin Bain was a guy who, uh, he when Craig White took over the club, he kind of refused to kind of like, uh, I'll tell the full story here, I've got it written down. On 20, uh, 6th of May 2011, ownership of Rangers was sold by David Murray the majority shareholder to Craig White as part of the independent panel set up to represent 27 minority shareholders in the sale transaction Bain refused to agree to the sale and was uh, subsequently suspended by the new owner Craig White Bain resigned in uh, June 2011 and raised an action of action court session in relation to a breach of his employment contract but abandoned his damages claim in March 2012 it transpired in an SFA tribunal in May 2012 that uh, he presented diligence at the time of the sale to Sir David Murray that proved his stance at the time of the takeover to be a correct one. So he was right. He basically knew that Craig White was a fucking crook. So he was, pre- he was presented as a, a chief executive of the Israeli club 
in September 2014, so he's been there a couple of years now. It's kind of a strange business move to go from Scotland to Israeli football. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. So, mm. what do you think? Uh, what should we go on? All right, what, what was the flight to uh, the flight Tel Aviv? Is, uh, it's a bit the same. They're all about one thousand and eighty dollars. <throat> So you can pretty much get to anywhere in Europe for about a grand from Toronto if you really wanted to. Well, it's not not from where I live, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what do you think the price of a pint uh, is? That's a good question. Uh, 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 £3.50. Rev? I'll say 4 4 This is actually the most expensive pint. It's £6.30. Mm. Yeah. So looking at it, right, they've got the highest coefficient plus the highest ranking in Europe. They've got relatively good directors of football and well organised their CEO is a hun that's probably one thing you would want to beat them for but they've got expensive beer so uh, and also will probably get killed for flying Palestinian flags so you probably don't want to play Maccab- Maccabi Tel Aviv you probably don't want to play Belgrade and I think that Malmo is probably the best of the other two I think the easiest game generally is the Albanian mob yeah or so e- even though their coefficient isn't as as good as the Kazakhstan mob, so yeah, that's n- n- none of it is 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 uh is uh, delightful, is it? No, <laughs> it's not fun. It's one of these things where I think Kevin Bridges used to joke about it. Whereas every there is a group of nay mugs, which is your dad would refer to a team as a nay mugs when he doesn't know any of their players, but he just realizes that this game will be relatively difficult. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think there's any easy game in there. Flying, no. to, Ka- flying to Kazakhstan wouldn't be fun. No. I mean, we just had to fly to Azerbaijan. Going to Albania wouldn't be fun either. But if, if, I, if I could pick any of the teams, I'd pick the Albanian mob. Then I'd pick the Kazakhstan mob. Then I'd pick Malmo. And I want no part of Pel- Partizan Belgrade for Maccabi no. Tel Aviv. No, either way. No, because that, cause I, I think I the, take... the Maccabi Tel Aviv team, they'll they'll know the history of, of uh, the Celtic fans and everything else. I don't think that's a... A, a place I want to go. I don't. There's no destinations on a pure for me. basis. I would actually maybe take Maccabi Tel Aviv before Partizan. I think Partizan might give us a better game. I think they've got more experience in their squad. And Maccabi Maccabi Tel Aviv's uh, team, like 99 percent, is Israeli players. Okay, Partizan a lot of really good Serb players, but they also have a mix and match of a couple of other Eastern European uh, players coming in. So I think they'd probably be a better uh, a better quality team. But I don't want either of them. So hopefully we get the Albanian mob. Well, maybe we can just uh, get the, the the same result that Liga Warsaw got this week. Oh yeah, they got three no win. They got three no win. I didn't. I didn't hear any uh, hashtag let football win from the Liga Warsaw fans today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't see any uh, of that stuff. I've got to jump anyway, guys. So I've got to move on. But I'll let you guys move on with what you're saying. But just before I go, I'll announce uh, the good news for guys in Toronto is guys from the Durham CFC. Myself and a bunch of guys from the downtown Celtic Sports Club founded a new Celtic football team called Liberty Celtic FC. There you go. So we're really excited about this because I don't know what it's like for you guys at your supporters clubs, but you go down on a Saturday morning or Sunday morning at 7am and there's nobody there because everyone can stream it in the house. I think the concept of like going to stream games at 7 in the morning, really dying when everyone's just watching watch it in the house, especially when you have to pay to get in. So it's just ridiculous. So we wanted something else about football and about Celtic to kind of connect. So we're like, we'll make a Friday night football team. We'll go, all go and play football, go to the pub afterwards and talk about Celtic. So it's, we're going to be playing in the hoops. We've got our position in the league. None of us can actually play football with a damn, but it doesn't really matter. So the three things that we'd be shouting out for is if anyone is in Toronto and wants a game, get in touch with us at JungleGym67 on Twitter. You need a, you need a goalkeeper? <laughs> we do need a goalkeeper badly, so uh, we'll fly you up for the game. No, I got, no, 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 I got a, I got a 15 year old to play for you. Oh yeah, send him, send him, send the. <laughs> he's much better the, than me. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say the wee man, but he's not so wee. He's not so wee so, anymore. Firstly, we're looking for players. The other two things are we're looking for games. So if you are uh, a Celtic Sports Club in the Ontario area, so out in Ottawa, or I know the boys, boys from Sarnia, listen to the show. We'll try to go down and see them. If you want to give us a game, we can sort out a Saturday game come down and play you guys Buffalo, New York there's a bunch of guys down there if they have a team down there we'd love to come down and play you guys but uh, overall we're talking about like buying shirts and uh, one of the guys in the team is uh, he works with a kind of sports firm they were going to design his old shirts for like $24 or $30 a pop for the entire strip and we thought this would be great but 
we're just giving money to an external company. And what we'd rather do is give money to the Kano Foundation. So what we're saying is that we need Celtic shirts. We've all got Celtic shirts, but we're gonna like print names in the back of it and put numbers on it and all that sort of thing. And we all want to wear the exact same Celtic shirt because a lot of guys have got the new one, a lot of guys got the old one. So what we're doing is we're looking for guys who want to donate their old Celtic shirts. We're looking for the sizes medium, large, and the XL. And uh, we're all pre preferably the retro ones from the 90s, etc. But any Celtic shirt we're interested in. And what we'd ask you to do is donate the shirt for free. If you're not wearing it anymore and you don't wear it, or don't use it, you don't have a kid to give it to, etc. And instead of paying you for the shirt, we're going to donate money directly to the Kano Foundation. So the $300 or $400 that will cost us to buy shirts, instead of giving that to a brand, we're going to give it directly to the Kano Foundation, which we think is a great idea. Because I'd rather give the money to them. That's give brilliant. It to some. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, we're also like, if anyone wants to sponsor the club or whatever, we want to try and raise as much money for Kano as possible and hopefully maybe something to the Good Child Foundation if we can get something going. So, yeah, anyone that's interested in getting in touch, if you've got a free shirt or if you want to play, um, just give it a shout and hopefully we can we can get some money raised for charity as well. There you go. That's so, yeah, awesome. so, um, so really excited about that. But anyway, guys, I'm going to split, so hail, hail. I'll listen to the, I'll listen to the, listen to the rest of the show while I'm doing my work, okay? Good, do your work. All right, take it easy, mate. Later, Bye. brother. Later, buddy. Now that now that we got the business end of the deal out of this, that's that's phenomenal. That's awesome. I got we got we got to put something together and tweet that out. Um, and I know we have one other announcement. We may do it next time, but I'm waiting for someone to give me a, a tweet back and then let me know if they want to get on the phone. But anyway, um, Rev. So the so the one question I wanted to ask you, since you watched the second half, first half, first half, even even the first half, uh, give me a grade for the referee. Um, hmm. Well, let me let me ask you this first. Did you think he was fair? I thought he was for the majority of the first half, and then it seemed around thirty second, thirty fifth minute. Mm -hmm. Then it just like once he started to actually call fouls, he started to call them only on Celtic. Yeah. When the previous half hour before that. Both teams are doing the same thing. Hey, if you're not going to make calls except for cards, whatever. Now we know, you know it's like, you know, after, you know, first five minutes, ten minutes, you see everyone's calling for fouls and he's not doing anything. So it's like, okay, now we know how the game's going to be. So now yes. we can play. Yeah, and exactly. And then started playing that way and all of a sudden now these small fouls are being called, you know, right before halftime. And it's like, well, well what's going on? You know, you just let this go for a half hour and now all of a sudden it's you know it's a foul so in in that regard i'd say d plus hmm. but um at best really since he, you know if he started to if he would have stayed the same way i would have said c plus because at least he was keeping it even really um, you're going oh, wow yeah. okay wow what do you think? I, I, I would. I was. I honestly felt like. I honestly felt he was. He was. He was even. Whether or yeah. not he caught. I mean, and listen. Boyata took that boy out in the box in the second half. That could have. If if that was, I heard. I saw people. You know, say saying that this referee was was the Swedish. Uh, you know, McLean or whatever. Listen. Mm -hmm. If that if. if if that foul took place in Scotland and Willie Collum had the whistle, he calls out a PK against us. I like I said, I didn't see the second half, so I don't. He calls a PK. Yeah. It's it's that's what I honestly believe. That's what happened. So I mean, I'll I'll give him a C plus, mm -hmm. uh, C plus only because there was a couple times when just blatant fouls, uh, and the one the, I mean, and the cards he gave were stupid. I mean, the yeah. cards he, the cards he gave one Izzy Izzy that was a stupid move. Um, the the one card he should have given was the one the foul on blue stick. Holy shit, that was he just wiped him out. Uh, that was in the second half at the end. But um, after that, I, th I thought he was a C. I was C plus. He was he was even. He was fair to both teams. I thought he was fair to both teams. Did we get a call? No. Did they get a call? Absolutely not either. A couple times, maybe here or there. But after that, I mean, I, I the only thing I was a, I was scared of was that he was gonna he was gonna choke on something. And a, a tiny foul in the box, and he was going to give it after everything mm. that happened. That was my only worry after watching. Like you said, when, once the referee goes ahead and says, "This is what we're going to do," or watching baseball, once the umpire sets the strike zone, 
Right. I'm scared the the one time I need him to not call something and he does. Right. That's that's what I was worried about. But I'll be honest, I mean he didn't he didn't go that way. So I mean, you know, fair fair dues to him. He did it. So he, he he called the game the entire way through. The end though was really non exciting. He just kind of like the ball went out of play and he just waited. It was about five, I actually timed the five minutes on my phone because there was yeah. no clock on the on the Celta TV. And it was like four minutes and thirty five seconds when he blew the whistle. Huh. And it was like tweet. And then he started. He reached out for the ball, and uh, uh, you know, then it then it went on. And then there was there was some jostling at the end. I think Scott Brown kind of took some exception to a couple of things. And uh, you know, I I honestly felt the way the ref was calling the game and the way that all happened, how how pissed off Bruni was. I I, I think I tweeted out. I I'd, I'd go ahead and take my bets if I if the referee just threw a raw stake in the middle of the. Of the uh, of the of the circle circle in the middle of the field and, and and let Brown take on the entire Cowboy team and say who comes out with the stake it's it's that's that's the way Bruni seemed at the end and uh that's what it looked like to me so that was interesting to say the least but anyway so um did you think uh in the first half did would what did you think of uh of Chifty playing in the first half uh lacking you know, I don't know if that was the fact that we seemed kind of not pinned back, but definitely, um, you know, run a play was against us a lot. So he was isolated. Yeah. Um, you know, blame that on the pitch, blame that on them being at home, whatever. You know, the times that, you know, he, he had, I'd say, two, at least two, you know, pretty decent chances and either um, – he just couldn't get to the ball. It was played too far in front of him, you know, through ball, um, or it was bouncing around or whatever. Um, but I mean, I, I was hoping to see, and maybe that's why I'm looking at this kind of like the bigger picture. Uh, since he came in, I was hoping to see more come from him by now. So I'm, I don't know if I'm being a little. Yeah. I mean, he seems to be the new whipping boy. If we can't, if, if we, if we can't get a, a, a guy to, to score in the first three or four games, he's in trouble. As far as from, I mean, if, from the fans, if you're a lone striker and you're not scoring, you're, if you're you know starting especially and you're not scoring, that's not good. No, you know we we need you know if you're a lone striker and you're the starter, you but, have. To I mean, but listen, listen, count, listen, you know? Rev. Let me ask you this: how many how many how many strikers have we had that could score lone striker style in Europe? Two. Okay, recently, and, and and they and that would be who? Hooper and Griffiths. Okay, well, I, I wouldn't even say Griffiths. I would say the only one that that scored in a bunch of games, you know, in a row, would and, you know was Samaras. And even uh, and even he took the lead pipe to the back of the head true. from the from the supporters for oh he can't be arsed on a day. Come on, you're a professional. I, I don't I don't buy that for a second. And Hooper, to his credit, he scored a couple of big goals too. So you know, I, I'll give him that. As far as as far as those things, but I mean, neither one, you know, made made Celtic fans go, "Oh my God, I can't wait to see him play up top by alone." Right. Well, you know that's, what I mean. That's a, a but that's hard the, thing. yeah. But how many? The, and and how many? And, and and tell me this: How many games do you see in Europe that are seven four or six three or three nothing or four nothing? I mean, come on, at that level of game. Oh yeah, no, I mean. I mean, and that's. I mean, this isn't just you know today and I guess against uh, Starnian. This you know it's uh, or Carabag. Yeah, um, you know this isn't just Europe. Like you know, he didn't really do anything against Ross County, right? No, and, and, but I will say this: in 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 Shifty's defense today, okay, the game, the way the game was called, did not suit him. That's like being a sinker ball pitcher, and the, and the referees, you know, a fastball, you know, he calls everything high. I mean, you're not going to get the low, you're not going to get the low strike. In, in this situation, he, I mean, he got fouled numerous times, no calls. Uh, you know what I mean? His his ability to hold the ball up, he was just beat up and taking the ball away. So I mean, what he was asked to do, I mean, it's not like he didn't do. And even at the end of the game, he made two two clearances out of the back. I don't know why in the hell he's he's playing striker and he's in he's in the box heading balls out, you know, on the break. <laughs> And in the same vein, you know, Virgil Van Dyke had that that run all the way up to the you know the edge of the eighteen in the first. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the ball taken away, but yeah, if we're playing long balls and shit, he's probably better suited, you know, yeah. himself being the target man. 
Yeah, exactly. Which, 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 if we were down a goal, I guarantee you that had been what Ronnie had done because that's what he's done before is put him is put <clears throat> Van Dyke up there to do that. So, um, so with that, when it comes down to that, did, did looking at in the, there was a, a point in the second half where Johansson played a dummy through the middle of the box when he had a chance to go and touch touch the ball, take a shot, and Shifty just wasn't aware that was going to happen. Now that I think this, I mean, we're asking Shifty to do so much right now and to be this type of savior that, um, you know, I honestly don't think that's actually a situation we need to worry about him in right now because it's just early. I mean, you know, they were saying earlier on, on, on the, uh, on the chat in here, you know, we're only one game of the season, which we are. And Shifty's been around for, you know, four games so far. So, you know, four or five games. So, I mean, I'm, I'm okay at this point in time with, with, with what he's done. And t- today, you know, was, was a little tough. I think he's, you know, I don't think he's the, the savior that we're looking for. And honestly, right. you know, yet, but no, it's no different from just like everyone else we have, we're going to pick up in the next, you know, five years while Ronnie's here, five, six, seven, eight, ten years, whatever it is. You know, at that, at this, at this rate, we're not going to get the finished product. Well, he, do you know why? Um, I don't know if you said it, if uh, maybe I just missed it. Why Ronnie's starting him instead of Griffiths? Didn't, haven't had a chance to read any articles yet. Okay. Cause that, that's what I'm curious to why he's getting the, the selection. Well, the Ross County game, it was because he had a tooth problem and, and he was up all night. Right, 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 right. Right, and he didn't. Oh no, I'm sorry, not uh, not not that was the first. Um, sorry, listen to me. Chris oh, played no, that game. No, no, um, right. The or first no, Carabac, Carabac game. Carabac. Right, yeah. exactly. That's well, why that happened. Shifty couldn't play. He still. Shifty couldn't play. Shifty couldn't play. Correct. I had sorry the backwards. Games. Right. So I mean, right now I don't know. I I gotta look and see. I haven't seen any articles, so I guess I'll, I'll pick it up and then and take a look. I I mean, he's. I, I've seen some things, and I don't want to get into actual football analysis. Um, mm-hmm. But I've I've listened to. Um, you know, ninety minute cynic, and 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 Christian Wolf was was saying, you know, Ronnie likes big strikers, and that's you know that's the type of that's the people that he likes. So I'm right. just curious. I mean, that may be what he likes, and that's you know that's and what I'm, he's looking for. I'm okay with going with a, a different starting eleven in Europe or a different formation in Europe. You know, it's yeah. a different team. You're going to have to go up against you know a different team's strengths, and you're going to have to match you know, in order to, to try to get an outcome from that. So I'm okay with that. I just don't see, you know, comparing the two. I don't see Shifty as necessarily being better or better suited for that. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not the manager, but from what I have seen, like I'm not saying he's, you know, total shit and we shouldn't have gone for him. I'm, I like the move. I'm satisfied with the move. Right. Um, but that's also more thinking domestically versus Europe. Yep. Yep. Uh, you, you get there. I, I think you'll get there. I'm not, I'm not sweating him. I think he'll be fine. So right. you're, you, so you're, uh, you're man of the match. Yeah. Just, well, man of the half, man uh, of the half with, uh, with Gordon. Yeah. You're going to go Gordon. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you what, Baton played well. And th- uh, once again, I, I mean, it's hard for me to say, but any, it, it hard for me to say anything other than Baton, but Brownie, Again, if you get a chance to watch the second half, uh, there's a point in which there's a vine going around with him do, with him doing it, him like cheering the team and like revving the team up, getting them, you know, getting picking them up while he's doing what he's doing in the second half. And he was absolutely, absolutely the the the, the rock in the middle and standing up for for his teammates and everything else. And and the one thing that made me happy about today's game, want to guess what that was? This is and this is and Chris, I know you're listening. And and Chris, we we want to tell Chris a happy moving day. So Chris is uh, is uh, boxing up and moving and unpacking stuff. But the one reason why I'm happy about today's game, you want to go? You want to guess what that was? I'd say Stokesy, but he he don't think he made the bench, oh, right? No, it's so. kind of <laughs> But on the positive side, what's that? Ambrose didn't get off the bench. <laughs> yes. Thank God, which leads me to the absolute whack, wackiest thing of the internet at all. So, so uh, Paulie was going through you know positives, and, you know, uh, you know, funny and, and bad stuff in the, in the internet. This is just bizarre, and this is how how bad the whole I love Effie Ambrose thing has gotten. So earlier uh, in July, 
and I just picked this up because someone retweeted it, and I, and I saw it across my timeline. The Scottish Soccer Show had actually tweeted out, retweet or favorite. Retweet for Effie Ambrose or favorite for Lionel Messi for the 2015 Ballon d'Or winner. 846 retweets, 40 favorites. <laughs> Come on. Really? Oh, God. And I know it's I know it's funny, and I know they're a satire, and I get that. But come on, don't you think the number of retweets or favorites it means something at some point in time in, in today's in today's today's uh, world? If if the if the kids had their way, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's so here's another one. Here, this is I saw this also, right? Retweets and favorites. So remember the the uh, when Victor Wanyama first came to Celtic and he, he ate spaghetti for the first time and spaghetti. He said spaghetti was good. I liked it. Mm-hmm. You know how many retweets I got? It's still going around. Really? Yeah. 20,000 retweets. <laughs> I had spaghetti. I liked it. It was good. I'd, I'd hate to know his um, his Twitter notifications then. Yeah. They, it's like it's like the like the police song. Do-do-do-do-da-da-da. Come on. Can you, get any more, can you give me anything more than that? Do-do-do-do-da-da-da is what I like to say to you. Come on. And then, so this is how much bigger he is than Chelsea. And I was just looking at something. It was just this, 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 just another tweet came through, and it was Chelsea wins the the uh, UEFA Champions League. Guess how many retweets that got? Uh, Five thousand. Got f- only fifteen thousand. So you mean to tell me when Yama eating as a Celtic player got twenty thousand retweets? It's more important than Chelsea winning the Champions League. That goes to show you how small their club is. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's come on. That's craziness. But uh, but spaghetti it, CSC. Spaghetti C. That's exactly right. The Winyama Spaghetti CSC. That's it. But anyway, so for American Tim's, this will make you happy. And 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 Rev, uh, this is gonna make you. This is gonna make you and, and Chris go bizarro uh, and pissed off. Did you hear about what Fox did last week? Fox no. Fox Sports. So this is how. So this is how stupid the SFA is, right? Instead of picking up a bunch of games that Fox is looking to go ahead and show something early on a Saturday and Sunday morning, right? 